Hugh Hewitt from Studio West, joined this morning live by New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Good morning, Governor. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good morning, Hugh. How you doing? I'm great. Now, I start almost every show, right before show, I read the Ellis items from Substack. I don't know if you know John Ellis. I don't know if you read it, but it's a good compendium of straight up news. Uh, Today, he, he excerpts a Congressional Budget Office report that shows, quote, detailed Social Security projections, finding that the trust funds are headed for insolvency by 2033 on a theoretically combined basis. Without legislative action, CBO estimates that the benefits would be automatically cut by 23% across the board upon insolvency. Well, that got my attention. I'm 66. I don't think they would ever dare do that to anyone at 76. But what do you think, Governor, and what should D.C. do about this? Well, you got to take action uh, because you don't, you, and you can do it. You can do it in a smart, fiscally responsible way without cutting benefits. And my my point has always been that the Republicans are terrible on the, this messaging because every time Republicans talk about this, people say, "Oh, they're cutting your benefits. They're going to cut your Medicare. They're going to cut your Social Security." No, there are actually fundamental ways to do this that don't re- find a reduction in benefits that do ensure its solvency. My fear is is probably just like yours that Washington is going to do what it does best: nothing. Uh, and just wait for the crisis to hit and deal with it at, at the 11th hour, uh, which probably means they just try to throw, you know, print more money and throw more money at the situation without some of the fundamental restructuring that, that has to happen. But it absolutely can be done without the loss of benefit. Now, Governor, what I routinely suggest is raise the retirement age to 67 or 8 and then add one month or three months every year thereafter because people are going to work longer. Means test Medicare more than it's already means tested. The means test, I pay the means test when I go on Medicare in a couple of months, and that's fine by me. I've got plenty of money. I, I, just, I don't think anything is hard. And then you tell people, if you're over 55, this, if you're 55 and younger, this is going to affect you. But if you're over 55, it's not going to affect you. Honestly, it's not that hard if you don't try and fix everything in one day. Well, that's it. And, and, and to your point, the, the sooner you do it, the bigger runway you give yourself in addressing these issues I'm a big believer in, 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 in the concept of promises made, promises kept, right? So if you're in the system now, you, it, it absolutely doesn't, shouldn't affect you, and these changes shouldn't affect you. But if you plan ahead, you can do it so any of the changes that come come to that next generation, if you will. And again, it's not necessarily a loss of benefits. It's just fundamentally changing, to your point, how you test things. You can find efficiencies. Believe me, I'm the governor. I found a lot of efficiencies in New Hampshire, and there are so many efficiencies to be found out of D.C. The fundamental problem is this, you do you, how many members of Congress do you think truly understand how this stuff works? Oh, I mean, it's, it's really complicated. Five yeah, percent. It's so few, right? So they are making judgments, policy judgments, on political headlines and talking points as opposed to really understanding systems. And that's always been my biggest frustration with anyone in government. I, I'm just a big believer. you got to do your homework. And if you don't understand something, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but you got to get folks in the room that really understand this and can put ideas on the table. I don't care what your political background is. Just give me some ideas. Cause now, Governor, point, you're, if, you are the, uh, you're the MIT guy. I'm the Harvard guy. I believe in messaging. You believe in getting things done. My messaging... You got A's. I, I fought hard for C's. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, except in Harvey Mansfield courses. Uh, but I, I do look at the Republicans right now, led by Leader McCarthy, uh, Leader McConnell and Speaker McCarthy, and they have not yet agreed on their three must-haves in the debt limit negotiation. I think it's irresponsible for the president to say no negotiation. I don't think that will hold up. But only if the Republicans come up and say, we want these three things in June. What do you think of the Republican approach to the debt limit negotiations, which is not to negotiate right now? Yeah, you got to negotiate. There's no, there's no question about that. I think you can have, to have kind of a hard line in principles and say, look, there are certain things we absolutely must have. And then you go to the other side and say, well, tell me the things that you must have, right? And you find enough folks on both sides and get the must-haves in and you leave the superfluous stuff out. you got to give a little to get a lot. And, and, and that can always be done, whether it's balancing a budget or managing. I mean, we don't really have a lot of debt in New Hampshire because we have a balanced budget and a surplus every year. My trouble is, and as a, 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 a most red states do, we have too much money, right? We're trying to spend our surpluses wisely as opposed to places like California and Washington, D.C., that have these massive out-of-control deficits. So um, there is a way to do it, but again, you can, you can be firm in your principles and what you stand for, but you, you've got to understand that the most important principle is you're going to be there to get something done and, and cut a deal. And that's it. Cut there, are deal. Three, there are three buckets, Governor. There's uh, non-discretionary spending entitlements. 
There's non-discretionary defense spending, which has got to be whatever you need. And then there's non-discretionary non-defense spending. On that last bucket, I think you can explain it and say to people, we're freezing that at 2022 or 2021 levels forever. And they're just going to live on that budget. Does that make sense to you? Uh, look, that, that's a start. I like that, but I'll give you one better. Just send it to the states, right? The concept of block grants. States spend money so much more efficiently than the federal government. So you that might be, but Governor, let me interrupt you. That's not going to happen before June. That might be a long term no. solution, but by long June term, we yeah, got to yeah. negotiate. No, I'm thinking that. more long term. Yeah. yeah, no, that's it. Look, free, look, freeze, freeze the discretionary stuff. Of course, that's like a no brainer to me. But long term, because I, I try to think of these long terms. You want structural solutions, so we're not doing this again and again and again. Uh, and the, the answer, I believe, is you, you send the money to the states. You really gut the federal government. You drain the swamp. We were told it was going to be drained. You was never drained. Uh, but you drain the swamp and you do that by forcing a balanced budget. I would say we're going to raise the debt ceiling with my left, with my right hand, and then my left hand. I'd say, and here's my balanced budget. So you know, Governor, I, I've been reading Mike Pompeo's uh, new memoir, "Never Give an Inch." Draining the swamp turns out to be uh, a State Department that 95 percent liberal Democrats and left wing Democrats, a, uh, a, a, a FBI, a DNI. What would you do as president to try and avoid the ambush that Donald Trump got hit by? On January 6th of 2017, when Clapper, Brennan, and Comey came in and ambushed him. I mean, it, it, it's clear from reading Never Give an Inch by Pompeo. It was a four-year guerrilla war by the left that's built into the swamp. Um, so I, I, I don't understand the question here. Are you asking how to drain the swamp? You, you yeah, if you're the president, like, what do you do yeah. about this vast bureaucracy, which is 97% left wing? You start, and this is what the former president never quite got. You do it by balancing the budget. Through that process, you cut all these vacancies. You send all the money down to states. You, you take the Department of Education, for example. You can cut it by, you can keep the, all the money, but you can cut it by 90%, and you get rid of all the bureaucracy. You send it to the states. You find massive amounts of efficiency in doing that, and you let states decide how to spend those dollars. You, you're literally saving 10 to 20% uh, of, your, of your dollars, of your tax dollars, and look, the number one tenant I try to govern by is there is no greater responsibility than managing other people's money because I didn't earn it. You did. It was right. your blood, sweat, right. and tears. It was your time away from your family. And whether it's in the private or the public sector, more public officials have to have that, that type of discipline. But it, it all starts with a balanced budget because that's when all the cuts happen. That's when all these, the vacant positions that technically have to get funded because they exist it actually written shrink, off of the books. Shrink the monster. I agree. But it also requires some management tools. Governor, we'll come back, talk policy, a little bit of politics. I do it. I do the policy first. I come to the politics. <laughs> the, the, the Democrats are not giving up on screwing your state. I saw you on Neil Cavuto saying we're going first. How early will that be if it needs to be early? Well, it, 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 we always make our first in the nation primaries early as it has to be. Traditionally, it's in uh, mid, mid January, early February, something like that. Um, but our law says we have to come first. We will come first. America wants us to come first. We are the right, the best first filter. We have in such incredibly high voter turnout. Our system has, has integrity. We, we can actually count votes and get a winner that night. A lot of states are having trouble with that lately, uh, but we can actually do that. And you don't need money and name ID to, to win. If President anybody. Biden skips it, what will be the impact on him? You know, oh, there'll be we... some knucklehead running on the Democratic side, even if he doesn't have an intra-party serious nominee like Kennedy and Carter in 76. But what will be the, in 80? What will be the impact if uh, President Biden skips the New Hampshire primary? You, will he lose it in the fall of 24? Of course. No, it, and it's not just he won't even get the, he's going to this is what's going to happen. You're going to have early states that like South Carolina, right? They want to move the first in the nation primary to South Carolina. South Carolina is likely not to even hold a primary. They didn't hold one for Trump in 2020. They just said the incumbent is anointed. So they're probably going to do the same thing for Biden. It's going to be a huge open door for left wing progressives that want to challenge Biden that clearly have no respect for him and don't see him as the future of the party. The old out of touch white guy, as they called him in the in the primary debates of, of 2020, they're going to have that same attitude. So there's going to be a huge opportunity, not for a knucklehead, but probably for some substantial candidates to run here in New Hampshire, garner all that momentum, all that free media, all that press, come out of the first in the nation primary with a win, and really with that political momentum, blow right through South Carolina where they won't even hold a primary, right? And so yeah. now Biden will be in, in, you know, in trouble. A really quick will. question for you, Governor. If he does follow through with his threat and skips New Hampshire, Will the Granite State vote Republican in the fall as payback? Absolutely. 
No, absolutely. The four, those four electoral votes go to the Republican in, in November of 2020. I, I agree with you, and I think that's what Democrats have got to figure out. Governor Chris Sununu, always good to talk policy and politics with you. Keep coming back. Don't go anywhere, America. I'll be right back. Hour three of the Hugh Hewitt Show rolls along.